In the last lecture, we were looking at the uh, Puritan effort in New England to hasten the coming of Christ, to uh, follow Christ uh, carefully according to his word. Um, in the meantime, back in Europe, uh, there were very different views emerging as to what it would mean to be a Christian and how one ought to try to pursue Christianity. Uh, as we look back on those efforts, we're inclined to say, these were really people who were in the business of betraying Christianity, of moving away from genuine Christianity. But uh, uh, in their own minds, uh, some of them in Europe really thought they were serving the interests of Christianity. They certainly thought they were serving the interests of humanity by trying to find a new way to unite people. You remember we've talked before about how after the Reformation with the division of churches, the church could no longer be the uniting factor uh, across borders. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it was the church as an institution that had given Europeans a sense of unity. But now with the division of the church, where would unity come from? And uh, people began to think, well, what we really need is to assert those elements of Christianity we're all agreed with, uh, those foundational principles of Christianity. Maybe just as a footnote, I should say, whenever anybody starts talking about the principles of Christianity, you ought to be nervous. Uh, Christianity is, in the first place, not about principles, it's about a person. And when you move away from the person to principles, you're probably uh, betraying um, the faith. Anyway, uh, in 1695, for example, the great political thinker John Locke wrote a work entitled The Reasonableness of Christianity. And uh, in that, he was... Uh, claiming to defend Christianity, but also to talk about how uh, reason can lead us to many of the conclusions that Christianity comes to, and those reasonable parts of Christianity can unite us all on a political uh, as well as a uh, cultural level. Uh, he was responded to in the next year by John Toland, uh, a deist, who wrote a work in 1696 entitled Christianity Not Mysterious. Uh, and there he was basically arguing that the really important part of Christianity is the part we could learn by reason without revelation. Uh, that we don't really need revelation. We don't really need the Bible. Uh, but Christianity in its principles is so uh, humane and so reasonable that we can come to those principles largely on our own. And what we see happening here is a movement away from biblical religion uh, in the direction of a kind of humanism, a kind of appeal to humanity, and increasingly moving towards uh, the notion that man is the measure of all things. That it's human beings without revelation from God uh, who can arrive at the fundamental ethics that need to bind us all together. And um, there was continuing debate as to uh, the value of the Bible, and some people said it's valuable but not necessary, or it's necessary to, uh, to fill in some aspects of religion but not necessary for the foundations of society. Uh, a whole new world of discourse is taking place. And um, it would lead on then in the 18th century to a movement that has been known to history as the Enlightenment. Uh, and uh, again, in the Enlightenment, there were varying attitudes towards Christianity. Uh, some in the Enlightenment would still call themselves Christians, would still say that Christianity is useful or even important, but increasingly amongst leaders of the Enlightenment, particularly in France, uh, there was a more and more radical notion that really Christianity is a negative in the modern world. Now, we have to remember that in France, uh, in the 18th century, uh, it was the Roman Catholic Church that was firmly in control. And the Roman Catholic Church was rich and powerful and tightly tied to the monarchy and the aristocracy in France. And so as the emerging Enlightenment and uh, its leading thinkers uh, looked at the French situation, uh, they saw a in their mind, corrupt monarchy linked to a superstitious church. And that's part of what 
tended to make many of the French philosophes, as they were known, um, many of those French thinkers uh, rather anti-Christian, certainly anti-church, anti-superstition. Uh, what human beings need to move forward is to be liberated from all of the superstitions that have bound us. Now, the Enlightenment was a, a very vital movement. It, it took uh, different manifestations in different countries. It was, as I said, more radical in France, uh, less radical in some ways in England, uh, less radical in some ways in Germany. Um, but it's, it's an, a, a very important movement because it will uh, lay the foundations of the growing uh, attack or at least the growing alienation of many of Europe's most prominent thinkers in the 18th, 19th, 20th century away from Christianity. And so when we think about the secularization of the West, uh, when we think about a growing anti-Christian sentiment in the West, uh, as it comes to expression over time in many different forms in the 19th and 20th century as well as in the 18th, um, the, the Enlightenment is foundational in a number of, of ways to that. And um, we can only talk briefly about it here, but uh, I've found fascinating a book uh, written by quite an eminent uh, historian all the way back in the 30s, uh, Carl Becker, uh, wrote, uh, published a series of lectures he had given at Yale under the title, The Heavenly City of the 18th Century Philosophers. And it's just a little book, uh, very readable, very uh, interesting, very controversial uh, back then and still today. Um, but uh, uh, Becker wanted to argue uh, that really what was happening in the Enlightenment was fundamental Christian ideas simply being secularized. And that these philosophes who thought they were so radical and so new uh, were really not all that new at all. And of course, great defenders of the en Enlightenment uh, are annoyed by Becker. And uh, Becker was not a Christian. This is not a Christian defense. Uh, but it's very interesting what he writes. And, and I, I think it summarizes for us in a number of ways what um, the Enlightenment was all about. Becker wrote, if we examine the foundations of their faith, that is the faith of the philosophers, and they'd said, they would have said, we don't have faith, we have reason. But I think Becker's right. Um, they are, in many ways, uh, expressing a faith commitment. If we examine the foundations of their faith, we find that at every turn, the philosophers betrayed their debt to medieval thought without being aware of it. They denounced Christian philosophy but rather too much after the manner of those who are but half emancipated from the superstitions they scorn. They had put off the fear of God, but maintained a respectful attitude toward the deity. They ridiculed the idea that the universe had been created in six days, but still believed it to be a beautifully articulated machine designed by the supreme being according to a rational plan as an abiding place for mankind. The Garden of Eden was for them a myth, no doubt, but they looked enviously back to the golden age of Roman virtue, or across the waters to the unspoiled innocence of, the, of an Arcadian civilization that flourished in Pennsylvania. They renounced the authority of church and Bible, but exhibited a naive faith in the authority of nature and reason. They scorned metaphysics, but were proud to be called philosophers. They dismantled heaven, somewhat prematurely it seems, since they retained their faith in the immortality of the soul. They courageously discussed atheism, but not in front of the servants. They defended toleration valiantly, but could with difficulty tolerate priests. They denied that miracles ever happened, but believed in the perfectibility of the human race. We feel that these philosophers were at once too credulous and too skeptical. They were victims of common sense. In spite of their rationalism and their humane sympathies, in spite of their aversion to hocus-pocus and enthusiasm and dim perspectives, in spite of their eager skepticism, their engaging cynicism, their brave youthful blasphemies, and talk of hanging the last king in the entrails of the last priest, in spite of it all, there is more of Christian philosophy in the writing of the philosophe than has yet been dreamt of in our histories. 
Uh, here's, a, here's a brilliant challenge, uh, and you can understand why any defender of the Enlightenment would really be annoyed with Becker. Um, a brilliant challenge to say, Enlightenment thought in a lot of ways is just a Christian heresy. Uh, you've pirated a lot of what Christianity teaches and believes um, without giving credit to God. And I, I particularly like his point that they didn't believe in miracles, but believed in human perfectibility. Uh, that's a fairly miraculous thing to believe in if you've had much experience of the world. Now, one of the things Becker does um, is uh, suggest that one of the ways of knowing a time and a culture is to find the key words of that time and culture. And he offers some examples of that. I, th I think it's a, an interesting idea, and uh, le let me read some of what he's written here. Uh, in the 13th century, so at the, the high point of the Middle Ages, in the 13th century, the key words would no doubt be God, sin, grace, salvation, heaven, and the like. In the 19th century, key words, matter, fact, matter of fact, evolution, progress. In the 20th century, now he's writing in 1932, so there wasn't a lot of 20th century yet, so early 20th century. In the early 20th century, the words would be relativity, process, adjustment, function, complex, as in you have a complex. Uh, he's pretty right on, I think, especially about the, the early 20th century. Now he comes to the 18th century. What would be the key words he says, the words without which no enlightened person could reach a restful conclusion were nature, natural law, first cause, reason, sentiment, humanity, perfectibility, although these last three were really only for the more tender-minded, perhaps. Um, but, but here I think he, he has really aided us by, by capturing how an age is dominated by, by certain ideas and certain ideals and certain slogans. Uh, we might have an interesting session to brainstorm about uh, what are the words that uh, most dominate our, our current uh, discussion and vocabulary. Um, but he's given us real insight here into what is going on in, uh, uh, in the Enlightenment. And uh, he comes up then with an Enlightenment creed um, the essential articles of the religion of the Enlightenment, now see, they would have objected that. They're not a religion, they're, they're just a reasonable point of view. But I think he's right. It's a religious commitment these Enlightenment people have. The essential articles of the religion of the Enlightenment may be stated thus. One, man is not natively depraved. So here's an assault on an essential Christian teaching. Two, the end of life is life itself, the good life on earth, instead of the beatific life after death. Three, man is capable, guided solely by the light of reason and experience, of perfecting the good life on earth. Four, the first and essential condition of the good life on earth is the freeing of men's minds from the bonds of ignorance and superstition and of their bodies from the arbitrary oppression of the constituted social authorities. So what, what keeps us back uh, from the perfect life on earth? Not ourselves, not our natures, certainly not our sinfulness. What keeps us back is superstitious churches and oppressive governments. Now in that creed, don't you see sort of the agenda that is going to guide a great deal of 19th and 20th century thinking. Um, it is not too much to say that Karl Marx was very much a son of the Enlightenment in a lot of ways. Karl Marx really believed that we could establish a perfect society if we could only get rid of those oppressive structures, economic, social, political structures that hold people back. Uh, in, a, in a sense, Karl Marx was a radical optimist. And I think that's why he attracted lots of people to follow him. And of course, Karl Marx uh, was looking at a world in which there was a lot of injustice, a lot of oppression. That's also part of what made his vision attractive. 
Uh, but here, a foundation is being laid in the Enlightenment thinking of the 18th century that is going to have a huge impact on the development of Western thinking uh, for the next three centuries, we could say. It's very much with us uh, today. I'm, I, I always cringe when I hear an American politician say, I believe in the essential goodness of the American people. And everybody applauds like mad. Well, I would like to say today, I do not believe in the essential goodness of the American people. Uh, I believe in the essential depravity of the American people and every other people. Uh, that's the problem that we face. Uh, I was looking at um, President Lincoln's um, uh, first regular proclamation calling for Thanksgiving services in America. He called for it in the middle of the Civil War in 1863. And uh, in that proclamation, he says, one of the things we have to do is to be thankful to God. And another thing we have to do is to repent for our sins before God. Now, can you imagine a president today suggesting that we as a people have to repent before God for our national sins? Um, I believe in the essential goodness of the American people. That's the creed that uh, people want to hear today. It's born of, of thinking that began to replace Christian thinking uh, way back in the 18th century and was, uh, was very, very important. But you see, it's, it's born of a de desire to find something that will unify us all. Uh, let's not, let's get over the battling creeds. Let's get over the wars of religion. Uh, let's get over all of the turmoil that has been caused uh, in defending various religious visions, and let's just use our reason. Let's find out what natural law is. You can see why it would appeal to a lot of people. Uh, let's make this life better than, rather than just thinking of the life of the world to come. It appealed uh, to a lot of people. And um, uh, it's very important then, uh, not only uh, for the 18th century itself, but for the world uh, in which the church would have to function in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. An increasingly hostile world, or at least an increasingly hostile world in terms of the intellectual leadership of that culture. Uh, there would still be robust religious life but in a world where many of the leading thinkers of that society, those various societies in Europe and then later in America, would be hostile uh, to the church. Um, while this is happening, while this new Enlightenment world is being born, um, while there really is coming a revolution, I don't think it's too much to say, in Western thinking in the 18th century, um, the church itself is facing increasing problems. We, we talked a little bit uh, in the last lecture about the problems already in New England in the midst of their great experiment. And uh, it led them to try to compromise in various ways. So that as early as, as 1662 in New England, um, they were so concerned about church membership that they came up with an idea called the Halfway Covenant. And the Halfway Covenant uh, came out of this problem. By 1662, there were numbers of young people who had come to maturity, who had gotten married, but had not yet joined the church. And they were beginning to have children. And they wanted to have those children baptized. But they weren't church members. They hadn't, as the Puritans would have said, owned the covenant. They hadn't become members of the church. And so according to traditional Reformed church practice, you cannot have your children baptized if you're not a professing member of the church. But these, these people were regular church attenders. They were leading outwardly moral lives. They appeared to agree with Christian doctrine. And if they didn't get their children baptized, those children, when they grew up, wouldn't be able to vote. There's always a social economic dimension to life. And so the ministers were under tremendous pressure. What are we going to do about this? They came up with this idea of a, the halfway covenant. If you're baptized, you're halfway in covenant with God. Not really. <laughs> 
but we're going to allow baptized members of the church to present their children for baptism. And that will keep us all as a nice family in the church. It was really a major compromise of traditional um, practices. And then, one of the prominent ministers of the 18th century, late 17th, early 18th century, Solomon Stoddard, Solomon Stoddard said, you know, maybe these baptized members who haven't really professed their faith publicly and become public members of the church, maybe we ought to let them come to the Lord's Supper. Because the Lord's Supper could be a converting ordinance. Maybe they'll get converted by coming. So now that the doctrine of baptism has been compromised by allowing baptized members to present their children for baptism, and now the Lord's Supper is being compromised, all in the interest of trying to keep the whole society in the church and desperate to find a way to encourage true religion. So we have all of these efforts, you see, creative efforts, one might say revolutionary efforts, to find a Christianity that's going to work in an increasingly new world. Uh, the new intellectual world of Europe, but also the, the new world of America. Uh, all sorts of pressures coming to bear on the church, and uh, we'll have to look at more of those pressures and how they were dealt with next time. Thank you.